Good afternoon. My name is Michael Packwood, and I am a freshman at the University of Louisville majoring in creative writing. Welcome to the Spalding University Writers' Room. You might say our next panel discussion has really gone to the dogs, but not in a negative way. Our panelists are some of the most highly regarded authors of memorable characters, especially those with fur and four paws. Given the topic and the wonderful lineup of writers on the panel, we're sure to be bow-wowed by their take on writing from a dog's perspective. Please welcome to the stage Silas House, Bruce Cameron, Gwen Bond, and James Kirby Easterling. You did great. Um, all right, I'm gonna be moderating this panel because Katarina was like, will you also moderate? And I'm, I'm like, I love moderating, actually. Um, and I have little notes here. Uh, I'm gonna start with Ah. Okay, I'm going to start by asking uh, everyone to kind of do a short introduction of yourselves and how uh, dogs figure into your most recent work, um, and I'll do the same, and then we'll go from there. So who wants to start? Who's starting? Sure. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. My name is uh, Kirby Easterling, and I had a, a short commute uh, this morning. I came up from Richmond. Um, my day job, you might say, I'm a business professor at, at Eastern Kentucky University. I also teach uh, business part-time at, uh, at UK. And um, I, I do a lot of, obviously, academic writing. And uh, two summers ago, uh, I decided that I wanted to do something different. So instead of writing about supply chain management, by the way, I've got a book on that too. <laughs> We're but, not going to be talking about that. <laughs> We're not going to talk about supply chain. <laughs> but I wanted to write about something that was uh, of, of interest to me. And the book is uh, titled uh, The Amazing Adventures of Chester the Wiener Dog. Chester gets a forever family. And it's really about uh, adoption. Okay, so you can read the book as if it's just about a, a cute little puppy and uh, that little puppy's journey to, to, to finding a forever home. But it's really uh, deeper than that. It, it also talks uh, uh, really symbolic of uh, adoption in general and so many uh, children that are in the foster care system. Uh, so I, I would say the book is somewhat allegorical and uh, I look forward to being with you throughout this time. Thank you. My name is Bruce Cameron. I came here from Los Angeles. I got here, I looked around and, and I was just blown away because here, the cars on the road are moving. <laughs> we don't do that. Uh, so I have I've got a new children's book out called Zeus Water Rescue, and so I have been going to schools. I've been to 40 schools uh, thus far on book tour because I wanted to increase my viral load. Uh, it has been a very interesting experience. I, I've, stayed, uh, at, I've stayed at a lot of Marriott's, and here's what I have figured out. At the Marriott, there's a bucket of eggs. At the end of the breakfast, they take that bucket of eggs and they send it to the next hotel where I'm going. <laughs> their intent is for me to deplete that bucket of eggs. That's, the, that's their goal. So uh, I love, this is my second time coming to this festival and I absolutely love it. I love meeting uh, writers. I've been sandwiched in between Gwenda and Silas so I've had a lot of rest because I'm just, it's like they're, they stop and they talk to Gwenda and then they glance at me and then they go and they talk to Silas. And I have, uh, so now I've taken, I've got these little buttons that I brought to give out the kids and now I just throw those at people. And, uh, hoping at least somebody will stop and file a lawsuit or, or in some way interact with me. You're welcome to come to my table. There's no wait. <laughs> Uh, where I'll be happy to sign uh, any, any one of my books. Yes, Love Clancy, this is not written for children, it's written uh, from a dog's perspective. This dog is a dog who's keeping a diary. He's a yellow lab. His, the first line of the diary is, Dear Diary, the cat is despicable. <laughs> it's Clancy's, Clancy is planning to rid the household of this cat. I will tell you that yellow Labradors are not necessarily known for strategic planning. <laughs> so it's not probably not going to go well. But that's, that's my current new uh, grown-up book, but I've got A Dog's Purpose, A Dog's Journey, and all the books that 
that uh, I have, not all the books that I've written, but a lot of the books that have been made into my movies are sitting there. Come by, talk, I'm really lonely right now. <laughs> I, I'm Silas House, and um, I live here in Lexington. I'm from southeastern Kentucky. I have a new book coming out next year, my first picture book. It's called Buddy the Beagle, That Dog Won't Hunt. And hopefully it's the first of a series of picture books. That'll be from Candlewick. And so it's based on my beagle. His name is Ari. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll get to know Ari. And, um, but my latest book came out last fall, it's called Lark Ascending, and one of the main characters of that book is Beagle, although that's a book for adults. Um, it's a, that's a, a darker book, and so I use the dog in the book to sort of to give you some respite from the darkness, um, but also he knows things the human doesn't know, you know, and so he serves a lot of purposes in the book. Um, they put a beagle on the paperback, so the Ari's very proud of that. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but they made him look sort of pitiful because, you know, he's like walking across the Ireland in the it's apocalypse. Right yeah. post apocalypse, you know. <laughs> so Ari's like, what the hell, why do I look I like this? I don't know what the post apocalypse <laughs> is. <laughs> right. Which is what makes him great for a, you know, it's great to have a character in a, in a, where a catastrophe is going on because they're not aware of their imminent demise, so they're much more hopeful right. than we are in that situation. So he serves a really uh, good purpose in the book, I think. I think that's totally true. I also think that you and I have failed everyone by not bringing e yeah. a dog. I mean, I really thought Silas would for sure have his dog here, so I didn't bring mine. Um, you know, next time we'll know. <laughs> Maybe we'll bring both. I'm not sure if later I don't Although, know. actually, my favorite, I'll just tell a quick aside, and then I will actually answer the question myself. But my friend Karen Fowler went to an event with Amy Tan once, and she got there early, and Amy Tan brought her two small dogs and put them behind the lectern. And they were, like, chewing on bones, just, like, hanging out while she was doing the event. And these people who got there afterward were sitting in front of Karen, and one of them leaned over to the other one and said, I feel so bad for her. Her stomach is growling so loud. Because <laughs> they had no idea the dogs were there. Um, I'm Quinta Bond. I write uh, most recently rom-coms, mostly uh, fantasy-tinged uh, books. Um, they do often star uh, fictionalized versions of my own pets who you can get to know on Instagram. I have three dogs and two cats. Um, this is my most recent book, Mr. and Mrs. Witch. It has tons of animals because I decided that there should be weird familiars. Like, why not have chickens and ostriches and lemurs? But they glamour themselves to look like cats and dogs when they're in public. Um, so you can have as many animals as possible, and there is a chapter from the point of view of a cat, not a dog. Uh, and my next book, The Frame Up, which comes out in February, actually Sally the Dog, my border collie, made it onto the cover. This is the little version of it. Um, she was the cover model, but the dog in the book is way better behaved than Sally. <laughs> um, Sally's like aspirational to be a uh, sunflower. Okay, so let's go back down the other way and talk about um, the role of dogs in your lives, because of course that's how they find their way into our books. So we've talked a little bit about everyone's pets, um, and this could be your pet now or your first pet, um, just how you came to love dogs and, and kind of how, how they function in your life. We'll start with Silas. <laughs> That's what I meant by the opposite direction. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have never not had a dog. Um, I, you know, my first dog lived to be about 18, so I had him, you know, up, like up into adulthood. When I lost him, it about killed me, and you know, and so I think all of the dogs I've ever had show up in my work, you know. Um, the dog I have right now, I've had for six years, Ari, or five years, and <clears throat> he is always on top of me, you know, like I, I usually write on a 
sort of a glider sort of thing out on the porch as long as I can. And he's right there beside me. And then when I'm in the house, I ride on a couch and he's right there beside me. And I mean, I literally have to move his ear off the keyboard sometimes, <laughs> you know, because he's got big ears and they creep over and block the keys. Um, dogs have always been sort of my, uh, I don't know, any kind of trouble that I'm in, I go to riding the natural world and dogs. And so <clears throat> when I was writing Lark Sinden, uh, which is, you know, a, a book about catastrophe and grief and all that, I really, if you've read that book, you'll know those are the main things going on, the natural world, dogs, and then a need for storytelling and community. Um, in southernmost, dogs, I realized that dogs were a metaphor for God in the book. And then when I realized that, it made a lot of sense to me because I just, I never feel more in the presence of goodness than when I'm with a dog. And so it made sense for it to sort of be the manifestation of the divine in the book. But if you set out to, I don't know, create a symbol like that in the book, it never works. It has to just like show up organically. And then once I know, once I knew that it was in there, I like turned the volume up a little bit on it, you know. But um, anyway, I just don't know how I couldn't get through the day without my dog, you know. It's uh, when he's not with me out on book tour. I get home and I'm like down on the floor with him, you know. And then, you know, to my husband and children, I'm like, hey, I'm <laughs> home. <laughs> yeah. So I grew up in a family, there were three children and three dogs at all times, and my parents left no doubt as to which had the priority. And I, uh, I was on my bicycle in the mountains of Colorado a long time ago, and I met a dog behind a fence, and the dog came running over to me, I always stopped to talk to the dogs, and this dog came running over to me, so happy to see a person. We were separated by this fence, but it was, and the dog was literally, pushing his nose through the fence, but then something happened. This dog sat down and looked at me just straight in the eye, and the way the dog was wagging his tail, uh, his butt was bouncing up and down a little bit, exactly the way my dog Cammy used to when Cammy uh, was in my life when I was an eight-year-old boy. And I eventually got on my bicycle, rode away, and thought to myself, I wonder if that was Cammy. I wonder if I just reacquainted myself with my childhood best friend. That never left me. And one day, uh, it occurred to me to write a book about a dog who keeps returning. And that book became A Dog's Purpose. So, and that book, A Dog's Purpose, was what steered me away from, I've been writing humor books. I wrote a book called Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter, and it became a TV show, TV show called uh, A Simple Rules starring Kaylee Cuoco and John Ritter, and uh, that's why I live in Los Angeles. It's an it's an involuntary act, <laughs> and uh, but I uh, from that from the moment a dog's purpose came out, I became the dog book guy. And if you go by my table, you'll see nothing but dogs on the cover. I could write a motorcycle manual. They would put a dog on the cover. <laughs> the best thing is people coming by and asking you if you wrote other famous books about dogs. Yes. Are you the guy that wrote The Art of Racing in the Rain? Yeah. <laughs> and I've been saying yes to all that. <laughs> yes, I wrote. Yes, I, I, I yes, wrote it was Old Marley Yeller. and Me. <laughs> yes, yes I, I wrote The Incredible Journey. Yes. Hard to top that, folks. <laughs> well, uh, so uh, my book here, Chester, the, um, the the wiener dog, you can see from the cover that uh, he is one of seven dogs. And uh, each of these dogs, they're real dogs, the names uh, of these dogs in the book, right? These are, these are my dogs. And uh, so this morning I left uh, seven dogs plus uh, my adulting daughters. I say that because they've not quite achieved adulthood, but they're somewhere on the path. Uh, they brought their three dogs over as well. So this morning, I was so glad 
to, to come and, and get to, to, to speak and to see all of you all. Because we have 10 dogs at our house <laughs> this morning of every shape and size as I'm talking about the book. You can see this big black and white dog. He is, uh, uh, his name is uh, Trooper, and he's the sweetest pit bull there's ever been. Has anybody ever had a pit bull? He is just so sweet. I won't go through all the dogs' names, but uh, I've, I've always liked dogs. I've always appreciated dogs. But in uh, 2008, I, I used to be, before becoming a university professor, uh, I was a supply chain executive with Corning, and I was actually on the development team that created the glass that's on the iPhone. And uh, with that, uh, an opportunity arose in 2008 for my, my wife and my daughters and I to move to Japan. So I'm originally from Pike County, our furthest most you know, eastern county. So I went from a very rural Appalachian County to the largest country, the largest city in the world, 42 million people. And there's four and a half million people in Kentucky. Well, so my, my wife and kids, they, uh, they were so kind. They, you know, my wife put her career on hold. She's a speech pathologist. We moved overseas to Japan, and we moved for three years. We were scared to death. Uh, after about six months, my company asked me to sign up for an additional three years. And I went home and proceeded to tell my wife and kids what a great opportunity this is. And... Um, they said, well, there's one thing that we want uh, in order for us to do this, right? We've always made family decisions. We want a puppy. <laughs> and so we got a, a little Chihuahua puppy. Uh, his name was Tycho. Uh, just passed away about a year ago. And uh, he really changed, uh, you know, my perspective on animals. I mean, anybody, I mean, you... You all obviously are animal lovers, or you wouldn't be in this room today, probably. But, I mean, is it not true they know when you're sad? They know when you're happy, right? They know just when to jump up in your lap. I mean, they are a gift from God. I, I really believe that. You know, these little uh, animals. I do a lot of work with different rescue agencies, and uh, I'm very pleased that my little book, No Pun Intended, has been adopted by several of the rescue groups. And I like to go to those rescue agencies here in Central Kentucky and, and do book signings and give a little bit of the money you know, back to those rescue agencies. But, you know, we have seven dogs, and, you know, I, I wish I had eight. You know, I just, I just love them. And uh, so, back to you. That's great. And you have seven, right? Is that right? No, yeah. Bruce? Of no, course. wait. How many dogs do you have? I have a single dog. You have a single Tucker. dog? I've heard him lying to people. I'm just kidding. Well, yeah, I'm lying about what books I wrote. I might as well keep going. With it. So, uh, <laughs> but in my defense, we petitioned Tucker to have more dogs, and oh, okay. he, he beat He the said no, no, he no, thanks. Um, yeah, I have three dogs now, um, and lost a, one that I had for 17 years last year. And to me, the great thing about dogs is everything you guys have said. The reason I put them in books is one because I'm always annoyed by movies and books where a dog, a character, is shown to have a pet, and then the pet disappears immediately, and this person's like in a jungle, and it's like who's feeding the dog? <laughs> like I had to stop watching Hannibal. I had to stop watching Hannibal because I got too worried about the main character's dogs. And I was like, I just can't take the stress. Like, this guy can't let his life fall apart. He's got like 12 dogs he's feeding. Um, I don't care if there is a serial murder after him. Um, <laughs> romancing the stone. They can't. That's right. Um, so, yeah, they will always, I, I do think it's fun to actually have people have to track uh, pets through a book and explain where they are the way that you do in your life. Um, and I do think they can fill different roles in stories, and that's the question I'm going to ask you guys about next. But, I mean, to all of your point, though, the great thing about dogs, and I think they do this on the page, too, is it's like the simplest it's the simplest thing you can do, right, is to make a dog happy. It's very easy. All they want is to be close to you, right, or for you to show them attention. Uh, they want to make you happy. Um, and so that's like a really remarkable, unusual thing. And cats are not the same. <laughs> they want to make you happy sometimes. They want you to feed them. Maybe. 
Uh, some cats want to make you happy sometimes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how you guys approach crafting your dogs as characters. Um, you know, how do you, I mean, it sounds like everyone has written multiple dogs, even the, if, if you only have the one book, you still have multiple dogs. So how do you go about writing dog personalities for dogs, and is it different than the way you approach writing humans? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think for me, it's um, the biggest challenge of writing a dog is trying to strike the balance of It, the point of view being relatable to a human reader but retaining the animal of the animal that's really hard to pull off because we assign so many human traits to animals especially dogs like you know when I get home the dog will run up and lick me in the mouth and so our go to is oh he's giving me a kiss no he's he smells the lunch I had earlier and he <laughs> you know, wants to lick that, you know, and just things yeah. like that. Um, so like in Lark Ascending, um, the, the dog is in deep grief because the human, the main human character is in deep grief too. And I was thinking a lot of like E.T. and the way that Elliot and E.T. have this connection. Lark and Seamus have a connection that way, for instance. Lark, as a human character, pays a lot more attention to scent than human characters normally do in a book uh, because he's, you know, connected to the dog in that way. So he has this scent of cedar that's always with him and he's always smelling. The olfactory is really important in writing a dog. And so I gave that to my human character too. Um, in the picture book, you know, the dog is just total joy and happiness and frolicking and he's making everybody else happy. Um, so that's his point of view. I, I mean, with every character I write, I give them a defining trait. And so it's the same when you're writing a dog, you know, the Seamus' defining trait is his grief. Buddy's defining trait is his joy, you know, so it all radiates out from that. Oh, so uh, when I set out to write a, a, a dog's purpose, my first dog book, I had no idea how hard it was going to be. It, it, because it's so limiting. You know, I found myself just completely bereft of references that normally work for authors. Like, I decided to wait for 10 minutes. Dogs don't wait for 10 minutes. They have no idea what a minute <laughs> is. And they're not gonna, and I've tried to explain it to Tucker, and he's like, yeah, I, okay. So, uh, I even bought him a watch. He doesn't even wear it. So. <laughs> What, what, I'm, what I'm noticing, uh, like I've written, most of my novels have been written from the point of view of a dog. And I've, I think I've gotten better at it. But um, the, the key that I would say that I focus in on always is the absolute irrepressible optimism and joy that a dog brings to every single moment of its life. And so, like I took Tucker, and I said, we're gonna go for a car ride, and Tucker was excited for the car ride, and we get into the car, and then I realized, oh no, I've got that Zoom meeting. I said, all right, we gotta go, and I, I open the door, and he jumps out like, that was the best car ride ever! <laughs> <laughs> so I write from the point of view of a dog, and that's my character. I get to write from the point of view of the most optimistic, happy dog in Love Clancy, the characters are all flawed and quirky and, and frankly kind of irritating, but the dog doesn't know any of that. I, I, what I really loved about writing Love Clancy is the dogs that are in there, there's more than one dog, they have no idea that their people are so strange to each other. People <laughs> recognize the, the oddity in each other. But the, as far as the dog's concerned, they're, they're just people. <laughs> Well, when I started uh, writing um, my uh, book here, I originally started out with just wanting to write a, a cute kid's book. And, you know, every child, you know, we, we've all had uh, animals. Every child loves uh, puppies. So that was my original focus, was just write a really cute kid's book. And when we adopted Chester, he's been with us about... Uh, two years now, uh, he was just, you know, a, a, a baby, you might say. 
and these much older dogs. What I observed was that they they really you know they they were caring for him. Uh, the oldest dog, uh, Tink, a uh, little Chewini. Uh, she's 10 or 11 years old, and she just immediately, uh, you know, no pun intended, but adopted Chester as if, you know, he was uh, her own. And I just, you know, I noticed all of the dynamics of all of these other puppies in some form or another, they're puppies to me, whether they're a year old or 11 years old. They just, you know, they, they were nurturing to him. And about that same time, my oldest daughter and her husband, uh, they started uh, fostering two little biological sisters. Uh, and they already had a, a, a child of their own. And so I was watching what was happening here in my own home with uh, these puppies. And I was seeing what was happening in my daughter and son-in-law's home with children. And it just dawned on me that there's a lot of similarities. That it takes a new puppy, I think we can all agree, it takes a new puppy a while to fit in. Uh, just like it does a child that, you know, whether they're fostering or fostering to adopt or have been adopted or whatever. So the book literally just started out as just a cute kid's book. But it really evolved, and I'm so thankful for it, that uh, uh, people read it in different ways. A lot of people, they just, oh, this is the cutest little kid's book ever. And then a lot of people read it and they, they realize that the characters that's in this book, for example, the lady, I call her Miss Howard, uh, the lady that found Chester and uh, who had a, a house full of cats and of course she wanted Chester to have a, uh, another home where he would be happier, his forever home. Uh, she's really sort of allegorical to that of a social worker because after she helped Chester find his forever home, she still comes and checks on him periodically. So anyway, I, I wanted the book to, um, you know, to, to, to be cute, to be something that children would enjoy. All of, the, all of those animals are real animals. The names in the book are the, 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 the real names. I'm gonna be reading it, by the way, at two o'clock out by the tent down in the children's area. I'd love for you all to come and let me read it to you. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be to write a kid's book. You know, having written a college textbook, I thought that would be about the hardest thing that a person could write. But, you know, actually this, I, I take um, a lot of pride in it because, you know, the little kids that have come by this morning and, you know, I've read them a few pages and just seeing them smile and their eyes light up and you know they're pointing at the pages and it's special so back to you <laughs> great um katarina wanted me to talk to you guys about writing from a dog's pov but we kind of already did that um let's talk a little bit about other animals in fiction not necessarily meaning non-dogs but they can be dogs but uh, animals in fiction that you've loved and have really resonated with you in, in uh, your reading, which I think I always, I always like to hear writers talk about their reading lives. The first one that comes to mind for me is the dog in So Long See You Tomorrow by William Maxwell. The dog has witnessed a murder, and um, I, love, I love that one. Um, there's also an Agatha Christie uh, novel called Dumb Witness that's about a dog who witnesses a murder and it's the only witness to the murder um, I always loved that I loved that one when I read it when I was about 12 and of course Jack London you know those books kill me though I love them but they're hard for me to read because the dogs go through so much yes. you know um, that what is it with kids' books, putting animals through the ringer? I mean, it was really a thing. Right. <laughs> By the way, I wanted to put a disclaimer on Mark Ascendant. Um, uh, the, the dog in this book is not killed, and the publisher wouldn't do it. I still don't know why, but um, because people tell me all the time I'm not going to read that book because as a dog, I'm afraid of what will happen to it. The person next to you is really going to relate to this yeah. because... And, uh, so I don't know why they don't just let us put a... There is a website you can check called 
the dog, dog does the dog, dog. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Someone told me yeah. to watch John Wick, and yeah. everyone who follows me on the internet knows I do not watch yeah. movies where animals are hurt. And I was like, what is wrong with you people? And they were like, well, we thought it was the premise of the movie. Like, oh, and I'm like... Well, I did have to watch it. Well, a movie I love is The Lobster, and it has oh, yeah. a horrific dark horrific. death in it. But it's such a beautiful movie otherwise, <laughs> but I have to always skip that. Anyway, I forgot my point, but um, the dog does not get killed in Lark Ascending, but the book takes place over 90 years, so obviously, unfortunately, dogs don't live that long. But the hardest thing in that book for me was to write you know, his death scene, and to make it not Trump traumatic, right. you know, and to make it as gentle as possible. Because sometimes right. it is, I mean, yeah. it always is a sorrow, but there yes. is a, I always say, there is a, it's like a gift you give back to them, right, when you're there at the yes. end. Yes, yes. Um, with them, and you carry that love forward to your next pets, right. or the pets right. you still have. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's be Debbie let's, Downer. Let's right. give the, let's give the, <laughs> Dad, let's toss it to you. Be funny. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to answer this question about uh, non-dog books that you'd like it, with some ruthless uh, self-promotion, which is that I just finished a book, reading a book. It was great. It's called Emery's Gift by W. Bruce Cameron. Uh, we're, they're thinking about making a movie out of it, so I grabbed it to read it. I hadn't read it since I wrote it. It was, uh, it came out right after A Dog's Purpose, and it has a grizzly bear on the cover. Emery is a grizzly bear. And uh, it did not sell nearly as well as A Dog's Purpose, and come to find out, we did some research, uh, when it comes to pets, not as many people have grizzly bears <laughs> as you might think. So it wasn't quite as popular, but I, I have to say, uh, it's an allegorical tale. I love uh, Emery's gift. And then when it comes to uh, dogs dying, so to be clear, in a dog's w in a dog's purpose and uh, other books that I've written, the dog doesn't die. The dog is reborn. But I've, apparently, people are skipping that part uh, because I've had. I've had very large men come up to me and look like they wanted to beat me because I made them cry. And uh, like that, there's a huge guy standing right there. His name's Doug Brown, and he's like very hostile. So anyway, so uh, so that's been my experience: is that people won't believe me. My the dogs don't really die in the end of my book. You know, Marley and me. We love Marley, 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 Marley. Dig a hole, throw Marley in it. That's the end of the book. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I don't, and I, when my dad had me re read Old Yeller, I took Old Yeller and threw it at him. I said, what are you doing? I can't read a book like this. So let's not, so, so give dog's purpose a chance. The dog does not die in the end. Well, I'm gonna try to cheer us up just a little bit. That was a little, little gloomy. But uh, I wonder how many of you uh, remember uh, the, the Little Golden books? Everybody remember the Little Golden books? Well, I was blessed in that uh, my parents had me later in life, and uh, I have two sisters and a brother. Uh, they were up in high school when I was born. And so my mother was a school teacher, and my sisters were the ones that would take me to the doctor, you know, for checkups and all those kinds of things. And every time that I uh, went for a checkup or whatever it happened to be, uh, there was a, a pharmacy right next door, and they would let me go and pick out a little golden book. And uh, just turned 53 this uh, this week, and I, I still have a lot of those golden books. But I remember always choosing the little golden books about animals. And you know, I, I still have uh, you know the little spotted puppy, little puppy. pokey little puppy. Yes. Right, I have, I have, but you know, I think about, you know, the, the books. the best-selling books of all yes, time. Yes, you know, the books that I really enjoyed as a, as a child, and I still find humor in them now. As you know, I mean, like Winnie the Pooh. I mean, little characters that, you know, make people smile, make people laugh. I mean, that little piglet character. I've got a, I've got a really good friend. And uh, he always says, there's humor all around us. It will just take time to look. And who believes that? I believe that, don't you? And so last night, I'll just uh, share this with you. 
So I told you we've got these seven dogs that's in the book. We're watching our daughter's three dogs, a total of 10 dogs. And it was about 10 o'clock at night. I'm winding down. I'm trying to get them to bed. You know, I want to I want to be prepared for this morning. And, uh, you know, my wife's outside with her bed clothes on or her night clothes. And, and she calls me, you know, on her cell phone, you know, from outside. And she's like, you've got to get out here quick. And I, you know, I go outside and, and our property backs up to a, a cattle farm. And a big black cow, somehow or another, had gotten across the fence. And our 10 dogs were chasing that poor old black cow <laughs> up and down the property line. And you know, I thought, well, you know, that'd be a, a something comical, something that would, you know, people would like to, uh, that'd be a good page in a book. So I think, you know, just animals in general, uh, you know, whether it's dogs chasing a cow or, or, or whether it's a little piglet or, or whatever, you know, animals, I think, you know, they just make a smile. They add value to our lives. You know, they certainly make my life richer. Back to you. And there is, this is a total aside about little golden books, but if you're really interested in them, the children's lit scholar, uh, Leonard Marcus, wrote a book about the history of little golden book, and there actually were incredibly radical people behind them, and they were revolutionary because they were a lot of people's first color printed books. It was, they were sort of like a, a cooperative endeavor. It's a really cool, and, and a lot of uh, people who fled Europe in World War II ended up illustrating those books. So. Um, Leonard Marcus, he's written a ton of, of uh, studies in different parts of children's books and people in it. In fact, there's another one called Dear Genius I always recommend. It's like the letters by the famous editor, Ursula Nordstrom, who um, really shaped children's literature and edited E.B. White and uh, Maurice Sendak and all these geniuses, and it's her editorial correspondence with us. Anyway, <laughs> back to dogs. Um, we're... Oh, that's true. What was the question? Oh, uh, <laughs> I actually, um, I just revisited um, uh, E.B. White last year, um, and I really do think that Charlotte's Web is one of the great masterworks of, yeah. of yeah. every of period, oh. and that Charlotte Died Alone is one of the most powerful sentences in literature. Um, and so I think that is a big one for me. Um, I also really was obsessed with Jack London and then became obsessed with him again as an adult because he's fascinating and so is his wife who had an affair with Harry Houdini, um, FYI. Uh, <laughs> like a random trivia collector over here. Uh, but yeah, I loved those books when I was a kid um, just because they were so intense and my uncle read both Old Yeller and Where the Red Fern Grows to our fourth grade class, and it's like, why were you doing this in retrospect? This just seems like a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, I've always been drawn to animals and literature, and I also grew up with Watership Downs. A lot of these books are, I mean, I think are the ways that um, classic literature kind of gave children an entryway into some of the most serious aspects of life, right? Ferdinand. Yes. That's such a radical yes. Book yes. So yeah, absolutely. I think we were yeah supposed to take questions. So um, questions. Who has a question for a, for the panel? Come on. Well, yeah. We so you guys think of questions, and we'll let everybody talk about their next project. You talked about yours a little bit. Do you know when it's coming out yet? Or uh, in about a year, I think. I hope. I have, yeah, we're waiting on the illustrator. What was it like to write a, a picture book? Was this your first picture mm -hmm. book? I mean, you're a poet, obviously. He's the poet laureate of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think that there's a real shared thing between picture books and poetry. But yeah. it is the hardest thing to write, right. I think. I think so. I, yeah, I think that writing a picture book is more like writing a poem than it is anything else. Or a song, sure. or, yeah. It's a... Uh, can't do it, just to be clear. <laughs> That's why I know. I've tried. I was lucky to sit in on lots of uh, workshops and classes taught by George Ella Lyon, who's one of the best picture book writers ever. Um, so she taught me a tremendous lot about that. And, um, you know, and I had two children, so I 
read a lot of picture books and you know some of them are like a misery to read and some of them you just love you know to read. I have to have a quick aside there and just say that Charlotte's Web is one of the most uh, life-changing books for me. I just think there's that's a book that everybody should reread as an adult. It changes with each age you are. And so many spiders have been saved because of that book. Yes. I, I have not killed a spider ever in my life because of Charlotte's Web. I'm like, it Brown could be Rankless Charlotte. earlier this year, and I'm like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I really sympathize with you, well, but this is yeah. too much. Right, right. Yeah. Who, is somebody not going to be bashful? And have a question. Yeah. What's your name? Right. So uh, I've got uh, three books that have been accepted by my publisher, and one that uh, I just sent her that she wasn't expecting. They weren't expecting me to try to break out into YA. I wrote a YA teenagers save the world book and just sent it to her by surprise. So we'll see if they publish that one because there are dogs in it, but it's not a dog book. I don't, that's pretty radical for me. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but I've got, I, I do this Lily to the Rescue series for the real little kids. I've got one of those. I've got my Puppy Tales. I've got one of those. And then I've got a new one. My book, Zeus, is just out. And the next one in that series is Ripley, a fire station dog. So, uh, and then I've got a book that was due in August that is still an outline. So I have to really get going on that one. I that, just met with my publisher and gave her the bad news that December first was impossible, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I am really fortunate in that uh, I write all the time. That's my only job now. I, I've had to have day jobs to support my writing my whole life, and uh, so it just feels like I'm on vacation every day because I used to write when I was on vacation, and now I don't. And now every day is a vacation, so I, I'm very fortunate. Thanks. So my uh, next book should be out next summer. It's a follow-up to. Uh, Obviously, it's the, the second Chester book. Uh, this one is Chester Gets a Forever Home. The next one is uh, Chester Visits the Community. And so he's going to go and, and visit uh, different places like uh, hospice. He's going to go and visit the fire station. He goes and visits an elementary school. He goes and you know, visits uh, you know, the, uh, the children uh, you know, in the hospital. So. I think it's going to be, uh, it's, uh, I think it's cleverly written. I think it's a nice follow-up to this one. And this book, you know, again, he just, you know, he wants uh, his own home. And then in the second book, uh, he goes out and just visits so many different uh, groups within the larger community at, at home. Don't end with the hospice, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> Surely someone has a question. Name of a uh, dog you've ever come up with, either in picture or what, but how do you approach naming? I think it's very, it's always, it's, I always have to give a lot of thought. Yeah. For my picture book, I just wanted like an every dog sort of name, and so, you know, lots. An every dog. Yeah. Sort of <laughs> so, like, you know, a lot of people's go to would be Buddy. Right. And so, it's Buddy the Beagle. And it, you know, it, it, it sounds good together too. In uh, for Larka sending the dog, like I said, he's a grieving dog. He's lost his, his only person so far, and he's finding another person. Um, so I thought he needed to have a name with some real gravitas, you know. And it's also set in Ireland and et cetera, so his name is Seamus. His, his man has named him for Seamus Haney, um, my, you know, my favorite contemporary Irish poet. So for me, it's never just, I just don't just pluck a name out there. It has to mean, you know, it has to work on two or three different levels. So I think of it the same way I would name a human character. I'm more of an air plucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have actually, a lot when, more books, yeah, too. Actually, yeah, I actually have to maintain a list so I don't name the characters the same thing. It's only two. Yeah. <laughs> So it just happens that uh, dogs come to me and tell me their names. I'll be writing a character, uh, it'll just be the dog. And then one day I realize, oh no, this dog's name is Zeus because I want a name that implies almost a warrior kind of footing for this water rescue canine. 
and Zeus just suddenly seemed like the right name. A lot of police dogs are named Zeus for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but I didn't know it was going to be Zeus. I didn't know what it was going to be. So, uh, yeah, it's an air thing. It just <laughs> hits me. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, we, um, I think about sometimes people intentionally give dogs funny names. So, for example, you, you might see a little chihuahua and its name is Champ, right? But uh, I think about, you know, all of the, the, the dogs in this book, uh, these are, you know, again, my real dogs and it's their real names. On Chester, though, I'll tell you a quick funny story. So, when we were adopting him, uh, his name at the Animal Rescue Society was Snoopy. And, you know, if you think about Snoopy, I, I think about, you know, a little dog that's mostly white with some black spots, right? So when we got this dog, you know, my wife, who normally wouldn't even, I mean, she just could not come to grips with this dog being named Snoopy because Chester is mostly black with a little bit of white. So we thought and thought, what was the best name? We came up with lots of different names. And finally, she came up with the name Chester. And I tell you, it's just the most perfect name. He truly is a Chester. He's a Chester in every way. He's just the funniest little fella. He's so full of love. And, uh, you know, he just never meets a stranger. I met someone named Chester once, and I was like, uh, it, I would say his name, but he, this is a real person who lives here, and he gave me a switchblade. He's a really strange man. I found his dog on our street, and uh, and he came up, and he's like, I just want to give you something to thank you. And he gives me an illegal switchblade. And, uh, and his first name is Chester, and his last name was something else. And when I found out what his name was, I was like, this is an alias. Like, he looked around, and he's like, chest of drawers, and then another item that's nearby. Um, and some of you are out there right now going, I know exactly who you <laughs> Uh, I always think about the character, it, like if it's a if it's a pet, which usually when I book it's a pet of a character, and so it's uh, why the character would have come up with the name, and that can be easy or it can be hard. Although I do realize that the now like two of the more recent ones are both art related because the not your average hot guy dog, which is based on my dog Izzy, is named Bosch in the book because her main her favorite painter is Hieronymus Bosch, and there's a conversation about Bosch between her and the hero. And then um, it's the Sally analog is named Sunflower for Van Gogh's Sunflowers um, in the frame up. So we've got just a one wrap up, one one more question maybe in a short answer. Well, that's a great question. Yeah, this is a great one to end on. So let's all just give a short answer, and it's what's the the most like profound or best lesson you've learned from a dog? We can start on that end and come to Just to love others. I was short. I was still uh, thinking about it. <laughs> I'll think of my answer while he's talking. <laughs> uh, dogs are so full of joy, and yet they are here for such a short period of time. And then if you think about it, we are here for a very short period of time. Longer than dogs, but maybe not by that much. So why don't we try to live every day with as much joy? What would be wrong with that? Um, dogs remind me to be still more often. You know, it's a constant reminder of just let things go and sit down and be still. Try to control everything. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me it's similar, but, but I would just say that no time spent with a, a dog or any animal really is wasted. You know, like that that is a good rest and recharge place to be in uh, because they are not asking anything but your attention right in time. What about you? Uh, be less selfish. I love that, to give her what she gave you. That is beautiful and a great note to end on. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Outside. <laughs>